Everyone handles rejection differently. For some, it makes them want the person even more. For others, it can trigger a crisis of self-worth. But for Amy Dunn, she goes on a mission to destroy her rejectors' lives. Her mother always said that if something is worth doing, it's worth doing right. So Amy doesn't do half measures when it comes to vengeance. If you've let her down or made her feel like she was lesser than, she'll turn the tables by making herself into the ultimate victim and painting you as not just an emotional abuser, but a physical one. She wants to leave a legal imprint on her targets, a scar they can never forget, making the rest of their lives forever centered around her. But how did Amy end up this way, and why do her manipulative ploys work so well? Let's take a deeper look at The Sinister Mind of Amy Dunn from Gone Girl, written by Gillian Flynn and directed by David Fincher. Ever since she was a child, Amy's parents made her feel like she was not enough by releasing a series of children's books called Amazing Amy. But the books were not an accurate reflection of who their daughter really was, but a perfect vision of who she could have been. When Amy quit playing cello at the age of 10, the very next year, Amazing Amy became a musical prodigy. If Amy was yet to be married, Amazing Amy had just walked down the aisle. Her parents peddled these idealistic stories to the masses, unaware of the implications that it would have on their daughter, always feeling a step behind, always agonizingly reaching for something just out of grasp. While she resents her parents for putting her life under such scrutiny, she's always been kept in line with the trust fund they've set aside for her, so she can't complain, as the very people that are making her feel emotionally insecure are also making her financially secure. The book's success taught Amy how to live a lie, and that people only care about what they can see, regardless of the truth. This bleeds into her view of romantic relationships, that both people will unconsciously start to live a lie together, trying to adapt and meet the other person's needs to hold onto them. This way they become different people than who they were independently, in service of something greater. But she needs a partner who also consistently aspires to be better. She can't be mediocre, as then she's just Amy, and she should be amazing Amy. So when Nick interrupts her interrogation with the media, who are highlighting how she remains unmarried while Amazing Amy just walked down the aisle, he gives her exactly what she wants and needs by proposing in front of them. As now, not only can she compete with this fictional version of herself, but the world can also believe that she's the real deal. But over time, Nick could not live up to Amy's expectations of him, just like Amy can't live up to her parents' expectations of her. But she did what he asked. She endured him losing his job and moved out of the city to Missouri when his mother became ill, stripping his wife of the life she knew. The power balance of the relationship has now drastically shifted in Nick's favor. She's a fish out of water, gasping for air. As someone who is meant to be the main character, she can't bear disappearing into the background of someone else's story like this. She always feels used, like people take what they need from her and leave her behind with nothing to fulfill her. First it was her parents, now it's her husband. She tried to signal her unhappiness, keeping Nick on his toes by still exchanging letters with her obsessive wealthy ex and using her annual treasure hunts to highlight his poor performance. But the final straw came when Nick began an affair with a younger woman, as not only does this, yet again, make her feel like she's not enough, but it also makes him the winner of the impending split, as he's already found someone else he prefers. If this happens, she'll be identified as the victim of the breakup, and therefore subtly looked down on, when she only ever wanted to be seen as someone people could aspire to. This twisted need for public approval and control of her life's narrative leads her to go to extreme lengths for revenge. If Nick wants to make her a victim of his decisions, then she'll be the victim alright, but rather than being the public victor of the split, he will be viewed as the real problem, and pay the price for stripping his wife of her identity. 
Amy's long-term relationship with the press makes her more knowledgeable in how narratives get cemented. She understands that the legal system and the media have to report and follow the evidence, but by the fault of being human, the lens through which they examine these alleged facts will always be guided by their emotions, meaning they'll blind themselves to other possibilities once they feel righteous enough in their beliefs. Therefore, she just needs to manufacture enough emotional tripwires for the public to turn against Nick. Once she goes missing, with a suspicious crime scene left behind, she simply needs to paint a false picture that he was physically abusive by writing a fake diary and confirming that information with a gossipy neighbour. As once the information can be corroborated by multiple sources, one of which is emotionally charged, then the abuse now seems like common knowledge, as the public are hearing it from every angle. She also knows that people care about and love to gossip about two key things money and sex. So she manufactures credit card debt, all of which look like the making of a man cave for the soon-to-be single chapter of Nick's life, as well as having him file for an increase in her life insurance policy. Motive established. And given America loves a pregnant woman, even though the real Amy has never wanted children, she steals a pregnant neighbor's urine sample so the medical facts will always state that she was six weeks pregnant and she can now colour the lens through which everyone examines this detail by falsely stating that her husband never wanted kids, the same husband who will soon to be revealed to have been unfaithful. Motive cemented. Amy sets it up so that the more dirt the media dig for, the more they'll keep finding. This will give her story wall-to-wall -wall coverage as the media will want to cash in on the salacious details and help drive the witch hunt for her revenge. In this sense, Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl is really a condemnation of the media, and exposes the futile way in which we process entertainment masquerading as information. As when it comes to situations involving people we know, we tend to need lots of information and nuance to come to a conclusion, often giving the benefit of the doubt to those we know and trust. But when it comes to strangers we've never met, it only takes one or two red flags for us to dismiss them entirely, as this allows us to morally posture our own virtues on the corpse of their reputation. But aside from just puppet mastering the media, Amy also manipulates her husband so that he'll look maximally guilty every step of the way. For example, the morning of her disappearance, as their marriage circles the drain, she tells him to go out and think about their marriage, knowing he'll decide that he wants a divorce. This makes Nick feel the most distant from the relationship right before he has to act as if he was the most invested in it, making his behaviour come across as cold and uneven under the media spotlight. She also tortures him personally by making her anniversary treasure hunt a tour of his infidelity, so that only he will realise something is up and therefore have to lie to the authorities, which will only make him look even more suspicious. She preempts his every instinct and manoeuvres him to where she needs him to be, places only he would know, like going to his father's house where he hosted his affair. But instead of calling it the Little Blue House, she describes it as the Little Brown House, then cunningly changes the alarm codes so that when Nick gets there, the police will be led right to him, placing him at the scene of the crime where she's already planted her partially burnt diary. A diary that starts off telling the true story of their blossoming romance, but then the second half paints a false depiction of her husband's abuse, claiming she felt so unsafe around him that she needed to buy a gun. This also puts Nick in a tough spot, where he'll find it hard to explain what's going on without sounding like a desperate man clutching at straws. As if he can attest that the first half of the diary that makes him look good is all true, then isn't it a bit convenient that only the parts that make him look bad are apparently false? This is a genius move by Amy, as either way, Nick loses. He either reveals he was having an affair, which gives him motive, or he tries to hide it and gets caught covering up evidence, which only makes the information he's trying to conceal feel even more valuable. It's all about controlling not just the evidence that's collected, but how it's discovered. Because we found a diary under your bed doesn't sound nearly as bad as we found a half-burned diary at the house the police discovered you at, and you quickly fled. 
There is no low Amy will not stoop to. By feeling victimized, she gives herself permission to do whatever she wants, always feeling morally justified in her behavior as she was wronged first. She manipulatively controls her victims by preying on their deepest desires. For instance, when she runs out of money and needs help, she contacts Desi, knowing that he was so obsessed with her before that he tried to take his own life. She then pretends that just knowing he was out there was all that kept her going during these past few years of abuse, as by dangling this possibility of a romantic reconnection, Desi is now completely under her spell. But really she's just using him in the way she hates when others use her. She has a need for money and a safe place to hide, and he's wildly in love with her, so she hypocritically exploits his desire for her own benefit. But Amy's always thinking about what weapons she has at her disposal, and no I don't mean the blade she uses to kill him, I mean the cameras outside Desi's home. As just like her fake image of Amazing Amy, it's never about the truth, it's only about what people can see. So just like she did with her ex Tommy, she gives herself horrifying assault wounds so that no one will doubt her story. And once she returns home, playing to the cameras like a damsel in distress, to keep her husband under control, she threatens his reputation, pointing out how bad he'll look for abandoning a distressed victim after all she's been through. At this stage she needs Nick to stay, as he's now a required asset for her to be publicly praised as her own new brand of Amazing Amy. She's the survivor, the virtuous wife that can forgive her adulterous husband and forge a new perfect path into the future together. That all goes away if he leaves. So knowing Nick has always wanted children, she impregnates herself using his sperm from the fertility clinic. This feeds back into her initial philosophy on relationships, that both people need to adapt to the other person's desires to hold on to them. He wants children, she doesn't. She wants them to stay together, he doesn't. It's all about give and take. But now she holds all the cards, as if he leaves, not only will he look worse in the public eye, but it will also mean his only child will be turned against him, as he's seen how far Amy will go to those who've wronged her. So Nick is coerced to stay, and continue the public charade that Amy's been living in some form or another for her entire life. Although everything she's done is undeniably psychopathic, if it weren't for her manipulative meddling, her husband would have left her for a younger woman and she would have been publicly pitied. But this way, she gets to play the inspirational role model and control every aspect of her family life from now on. Everything is on her terms, or she can always claim that Nick went back to his abusive ways as the media already has lots of dirt on him and an unshakably favourable bias towards her. What's so evil and despicable about Amy Dunn's crimes is that she hides behind society's natural inclination to defend women from male predators, and uses it as her primary weapon. So much so that she reflexively relies on this instinct to override any suspicious holes in her story, as if anyone ever questions her inconsistencies, it's dismissed as bad taste, as victim blaming. But behind her carefully crafted public image, she's the maniac orchestrating everything in her favour. As long as the media are still by her side, there's nothing she can't do, and her hollow dreams of being seen to be living the perfect life can finally come true. So when it comes to the dark art of manipulation, maybe she was always Amazing Amy after all. Well, if you've made it this far, firstly, thank you for watching, but if you could now give the video a like, possibly even leave a comment and click on that subscribe button, it will encourage that mysterious algorithm to do its thing.